If you're a Star Wars fan, articles like these are likely familiar to you. The Acolyte could save Star Wars. The Rey movie can save the franchise. Dave Filoni will save Star Wars. Did the Mandalorian save Star Wars? Even John Wick is saving Star Wars now. You're not very good at retiring. I'm working on it. Star Wars has been a mess lately. For the last, well, at this point, for the last few years, fans have been religiously waiting for the one product to save them all. The ultimate piece of Star Wars media that will drag their beloved franchise out of the Sarlacc pit. Ray Skywalker. After years of bombardment with content ranging from fun, to okay, to awful, to inexcusable, to forgettable, to great, yes, I'm looking at you Andor, the only outstanding piece of live action Star Wars media of the last 20 years, and finally to mediocre, and that is the most frequent offender to be honest. While it's almost funny at this point to dismiss Disney Star Wars as just bad, the fair assessment is that the average quality of the massive amount of TV shows and movies we got lately is just meh. I never thought I'd say this, but Star Wars fatigue is real. And it's not the universe I'm tired of, it's disappointment. DISAPPOINTED! And the huge problem with articles like the ones I started with, and the mentality itself, is that it's a self-sustaining beast that could infinitely prolong the issues. And it's precisely why shows like The Acolyte or even Dave Filoni will not save Star Wars. So let's get into why exactly. First off, Leslie Headland was clear about making Star Wars all about herself as clearly this is the perfect opportunity to focus on the showrunner's queer identity. The concept of true love being between two sisters and not a heterosexual relationship. Like to hire people who write the show who haven't seen Star Wars yet. If this doesn't scream mismanagement, I don't know what will. As a queer person? Clearly the vast majority of people don't think a gay story about sisters, with martial arts in a world with lightsabers and blasters, will be the one show to rule them all. But more importantly, there will never be one, as long as the IP is under the same management. To get a good understanding of the problems, we need to take a look at the overall structure, or lack thereof, within Disney Star Wars. So let's go back in time for a sec. It's the year 2015, and the long-awaited revival of Star Wars is here, with The Force Awakens. Isn't it funny how today, most of us fans look at this movie with disdain, as it marks the start of a long and stretched out disease, the first of, in this case, Three Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the sequel trilogy. But at the time, people did like this movie. It was vastly successful and the hype was insanely high. And for a while, it looked like J.J. Abrams managed to do it. Of course, there was plenty of criticism for the movie, I'll get to that in a sec, but generally The Force Awakens was well received by audiences and critics alike. The general consensus was that the movie is too safe but sufficiently fun and nostalgic for a franchise revival. And on its own, that would probably have stayed like that. However, the glaring flaws the general public looked past at the time were so amplified by the sequels that nowadays not a lot of fans look fondly at the movie. Yes, it relied too much on nostalgia. Yes, the script was uninspired. Yes, another Death Star. And yes, Rey was just an OP version of Luke. But maybe, just maybe, history could repeat itself with the sequel. We get another Empire Strikes Back that could right all the wrongs. And oh how wrong we were. But not as wrong as the apparent 99% of my viewers, who aren't subscribed to Space Crew Productions. Imagine being part of that 1% elite. But back to spaceships and lightsabers. Before the infamous sequel to Force Awakens, we did get Rogue One, which was generally regarded as between okay and good. But the characters were indisputably generic and forgettable, and the dialogue was lackluster. But this was sort of made up for by the outstanding visuals, great action and well-placed nostalgia bait. Then, in 2017, The Last Jedi was the start of a declining quality so steep, no one could really foresee. Worse than that, it was the ultimate start of a brand new schism among fans, critics and pretty much everyone involved with Star Wars. The people who hated it did so passionately, and many who loved it took a weird, made-up moral and intelligent high ground, disclaiming that any and all who didn't go along with the abysmal choices of Ryan Johnson just didn't get it, and were haters, trolls and many more buzzwords. And even though The Last Jedi brought in a truckload of millions for Disney, they did feel the potential dangers of its reception. So they canned Ryan Johnson, who was set to direct one more, and got J.J. Abrams back, who came up with the most ludicrous movie, the final nail in the coffin, which was Rise of Skywalker. I won't waste your time by going into detail as to why this movie was atrocious, but the awful script, contrived plot with more space MacGuffins, a terrible lead, the forced comeback of Palpatine and the clear lack of vision for the trilogy 
was enough to warrant the first cries for help among fans. For someone to come in, wipe the tears from their disappointed faces and make up for the bad with something fresh, but true to the Star Wars we know and love. And boy let me tell you, Solo, a Star Wars story, was not that in any shape or form. Rumors and articles about the production hell that was this movie, with director swaps and reshoots, make all the sense watching it. And it was the first major box office bomb from the Star Wars IP, losing Disney millions of dollars. Of course the damage control machine got to work very soon, because what else could be the cause of such a bomb other than the famous trolls? And this is important, as from this point on the strategy of not only alienating but antagonizing the core audience of Star Wars with broad terms like Star Wars trolls and any and all isms and phobias remains the main PR defense strategy of Disney. They make an awful lead character, who happens to be a woman, call those who dislike said character sexist. This drives the conversation away from actual valid criticism of the character. Or they come up with Reva, a predictable and all-around badly written character that was a major contributor to the failure that was the Obi-Wan show and call all critics racist, again driving the conversation away from valid criticism of bad writing, directing, acting and visual effects, especially so. And I'm not trying to take anything away from the actress who reportedly did endure a lot of hate, but it's time to acknowledge that all these so-called Star Wars trolls are nothing more than a loud vocal minority, primarily existing in the internet space. And the fact that Reva, Rey, Holdo and the like who warranted a similar response from Disney were simply badly written characters. And these so-called trolls served Disney better than anyone else, as they could use them as a scapegoat representing the toxic fandom and continue to get away with the gross mismanagement of the IP. But no matter the facade of hiding behind virtue signaling, Disney knew they needed something to get their reputation and money up after the sequels and Solo, and enter John Favreau alongside Dave Filoni with The Mandalorian in 2019. The first people hailed as those who could save Star Wars delivered something that was fun, extremely marketable, nostalgic, and all around pretty well received. The episodic nature of the show provided a breath of fresh air from the overarching contrived plotlines of the sequels and Skywalkers in general. The show wasn't without flaws for sure, but the simplicity of it is what it's made its charm. And after its success, Disney was not needed to be taught twice and started pumping out direct streaming content like There's No Tomorrow. For the first time in a while, Star Wars fans started to wonder if the franchise was saved. And the announcement of a TV show about Boba Fett and Obi-Wan, two fan favorites, was met with immense hype and high hopes. A new hope, if you will. Which was then gradually shattered into more and more disappointment, as after Mandalorian Season 2, the book of Boba Fett was the start of a new decline in quality. Turns out if you let go of Favreau and Robert Rodriguez's hands too much, they come up with a goofy, weird concept that was anything but the awaited badass Boba Fett show fans were hoping for. The fact that the highlight of the show were the two episodes the title character was barely in when Mando hijacked the show for a bit, was enough to stir the ship back towards the Mandalorian, and more and more power to Filoni, who the fans seem to absolutely adore due to his work on the Clone Wars and the animated side of Star Wars content, I would say somewhat rightfully so at the time. But before we get to Filoni's rise, disappointment followed disappointment, with the arrival of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And this one hurts particularly bad. Obi-Wan was always my favorite prequel character, and the promise of Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen's return got even my jaded, burnt-out hopes up for a bit, only to be stomped by an incompetent and obvious body hire of a director in Deborah Chow. The show was simply bad in almost all objective aspects, with the only redeeming qualities being the occasionally well-placed nostalgia and Christensen's charismatic return. But not even the well-done final duel between the two could save this show, as the flaws of terrible action scenes, dialogue, and unnecessary characters taking away sweet time from actual fan favorites left a bad taste in the fandom's mouth, and the show was cancelled shortly after. But to my surprise, the one show I couldn't care less about going into it, Andor, proved to be the shining jewel among all the trash. A show about a character not many really cared for, including me, who died in Rogue One, turned out to be an outstanding TV series, with well thought out characters, brilliant acting, interesting lore building, and the brooding, dark, at times even cyberpunk feel to Andor, to this day it remains the best piece of live action Star Wars after the original trilogy. And that's coming from someone who adores the prequels, with all their flaws. But lo and behold, the high of watching Endor didn't last for long as the third season of The Mandalorian, while it wasn't awful, proved to be noticeably worse than its predecessors, especially towards the second half, with the shift of focus to an overarching story instead of the episodic nature of the previous seasons, with very noticeably bad CGI. And then finally, Ahsoka. Or should I say Rebels Season 5? Again, a show that was far from unwatchable, but wasn't particularly good either. The animated characters did not translate that well into live action, and the portrayal of brooding Ahsoka who's more stoic than Diogenes was far from a show-carrying charismatic lead. 
Filoni was given seemingly complete freedom with this one, and even more so after, as he is now the guy reportedly overseeing pretty much everything Star Wars, but I say enough is enough. This strategy of damage control, of trial and error decision making, needs to stop. Disney has been consistently delivering subpar material, and whenever someone brings anything remotely of quality to the table, they give them the steering wheel and let them take the fall. If you look at it this way, the reactionary decisions are obvious. J.J. Abrams delivered Force Awakens, followed by Ryan Johnson with The Last Jedi. That turned out to be trash, so hey, here's J.J. again with The Rise of Skywalker. Well, that was trash, so let's try Favreau, as Mendo was good, and give this Deborah Chow a shot. Well, Boba Fett and Obi-Wan were trash, so here goes nothing, Filoni takes the wheel and calls the shots now. Mendo Season 3 was kind of a fail, so let's try a movie version. When does it end? Not here, that's for sure, as we are yet to see the Ray movie everyone's waiting for. Right? Might as well give it to a director who has nothing to do with Star Wars. What could go wrong? I like to make men uncomfortable. I enjoy <laughs> making men uncomfortable. <laughs> and here we are with people still thinking that the acolyte will be any different. The slate needs to be wiped clean for it to work again. We may get great shows or movies in the future. I have high hopes for Endor season 2. Hell, even Acolyte could prove me wrong and turn out good, though I doubt it. But Star Wars' reputation will forever be stained by Kathleen Kennedy, Ryan Johnson, the sequel trilogy, Solo, the Boba Fett and Obi-Wan show, and so on. And we need to realize, there is no saving this. As long as the strategy of damage control, trial and error decisions, the antagonization of fans and hiring of incompetent people remains. We need a shift in management bigger than the Disney acquisition itself for that. Star Wars movies used to be huge events. Now every major release just makes fans dread another desecration of the property. And that's the problem with this savior mentality. We keep getting the same trash packaged in different color boxes, but we eat it up just the same. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't at least a bit more hopeful with Filoni in the chair. But I genuinely miss good Star Wars, and more so, good Star Wars movies. Cinematic events, not fan fiction that is infused with modern day politics. But I fear the ship sank too deep, and waiting for a new director, writer, showrunner to save the franchise will just set people up for even more disappointment as the franchise needs something much bigger and more impactful than someone getting a higher position at Disney. And I hate that my favorite franchise's prospects are always seemingly dependent on corporate decisions and the guidance of body hire showrunners don't give a damn about this universe. But you know what I don't hate? Sand. Not like here. Here everything is soft. And smooth. And that's why I love Dune, so I recently did a deep dive analysis of Dune Part 2 and an awesome movie called Late Night with the Devil, so check those out if you are interested in the subject. And if you agree or disagree with my grim look at Star Wars today, please do so loudly, as there is a comment section for it just below this video. I genuinely would love to hear your opinions. And lastly, remember to subscribe to the channel for more Star Wars content, movie reviews and everything movies in the future, so see you soon. As a queer person.